So we're going to pick up where we left off last week, which was talking about indexes. Um, I'm going to cover indexes and transactions today. Um, they're two totally unrelated topics. They're essentially, um, when you look at the course outline, there's certain topics we have to cover to cross our T's and dot our I's and say we covered all the material we're supposed to cover. These last two items are the last two things we need to cover. And the strange thing is, is both of these topics would either be a th three lectures or half an hour. There's no in between. So the half hour version is, this is what it is, this is what it does, this is why you'd use it. And uh, for example, the second topic, transactions, uh, is often a third year university course onto itself. Like literally, you could have an entire course in university dedicated to that topic if you wanted. Um, we are definitely not going anywhere near that level of detail. Uh, considering I never went to university, I probably couldn't go into that level of detail even if I wanted to. Okay, so indexes. So indexes is a construct in the database designed to speed up your queries. If you do not have indexes when you're using your where clauses, you will notice that sometimes some of your queries are a little slow. And some of you have probably experienced it already with the flight DB, where if you write the query one way, it's a little slower than if you write it a different way because you're keying off on different things. So what happens is if you run a, a, a query and you have a, something in your where clause and that item is not indexed, what it does is it'll go row one, is it there? Row two, is it there? It'll do what's called a table scan. It'll read the entire table, row by row, trying to match. So the purpose of the index is to avoid table scans as much as possible. So the best analogy for you guys for an index is, you know, when you have textbooks and you're trying to find a specific topic in the textbook, you tend to flip to the back section called the index. You look up the topic, it gives you a page number. Then you go to the page number and then you just search that one page for that topic. It might still be hard to find, but instead of searching 300, three or 400 pages, you're looking through one page. Indexes in the database do something similar. What it does is it puts in fingerprints of specific strings or integers or whatever, include and a physical address location. By physical address, it means where literally is it in the table. Different database servers do this differently. Um, Oracle's cool. Oracle actually stores the uh, sector on the disk. It literally stores the physical location on the hard drive, or at least what it thinks is the physical location on the hard drive. Uh, Postgres um, does something similar. Uh, it keeps an, uh, 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 there's a hidden column in Postgres that actually has like a unique identifier and it it's literally in order, one, two, three, four, five, it's not one, two, three, four, five, but so that if it needs to go find records, you know, 3,556 and 36,000, it knows physically where to go in the file to go get, get it. MySQL, it does whatever it wants to do. Um, I mean, it does something similar, obviously it keeps track of where things are in the file, but it's the way it handles it's just slightly different. So I couldn't tell you how SQL Server does it or how DB2, because I don't know enough about their internals to be able to tell you what they do. Um, so an index um, is not a table, but it's a data structure used to determine location in a file where certain data are. Um, primary keys are always automatically indexed. So when you create something as a primary key, it will be indexed. Instantly, do not pass go, that is it. It's gonna happen whether you want it to or not. Other fields or combinations of fields can be indexed. Um, these are known as secondary indexes, sometimes also known as non-unique indexes. Uh, they can be unique, which is why that one's in parentheses, but they're known as secondary indexes. So the most common index method is known as the B plus tree. The, and for years, until about four years ago, I was operating under the assumption that B plus tree meant binary plus tree. No, no. 
It stands for best plus tree, literally best tree. I had somebody call me out in class and then they actually had the proof and no, they didn't edit the Wikipedia article, which, you know, sometimes people will do to win an argument, right? Um, never argue with someone that knows how to check the history of a page. <laughs> so it's known as the best plus tree. And the way it works is it's it fans out up to four levels deep, as many wide as it needs. And what it'll do is it does a similar system on, it divides in half, takes that half, divides it in half, and then takes that half and divides it in half. So for example, if you were to say, I want you to guess a number between one and 10, what's the first number you should always pick? Five. And if I say higher, what would be the next number? Would be the next, the, whatever's in between five and 10. Seven. If I say higher or lower, you're almost at the right answer, right? After three jumps. Uh, theoretically, you could guess a number between, you know, zero and 105 guesses in the same process. Usually that's about the stat. It's about five guesses for that because you're just going to take it and divide it. The B plus tree, tree does the exact same thing. So it'll divide it up piece by piece into separate, into separate sections. So if we have the, the key in this case, um, and it's, God, that's small. Let's see if I can zoom in a little, a little. Now that'll work. I don't need the whole, the whole thing. All right. So let's just say the, uh, the index is broken down as follows. So it's everything until F everything to Z, and then somewhere in the middle, there's blocks between F and Z. So whatever would be probably something H to P, for example, would be the next set. And if we're looking for something that starts with a D, it would go, hey, are we between A and F? Yes, it would drop down to the next block. It would go, is it A to B, D or E, or F? Well, it's D or E, it would drop down and then it would divide it, get one more time if it had to, to grab the next round of things. So at that point, instead of going through and going, okay, is it this row, is it this row, is it this row? It'll go, it's this, jump to here, jump to there. Okay, now we know that the ones we're looking for are probably in this area in the table. And that's literally what the B plus, tr the B plus tree does. Um, so the average time to find the records based on the index is usually a factor of the depth of the tree and how long each list is. So obviously no matter what, it's never gonna go past four down. And it's just how long does it take to figure out where it falls into each of the branches. Um, so there's unique and non-unique indexes. The primary key is always unique, uh, but in theory, you could apply unique indexes to other fields if you wanted to. Um, a, a common one you'll see is email address. So you can't have a, the same email address go into a system twice. Um, phone numbers are often set up as unique, potentially, not as often. Um, so yeah, those are, you know, things you'd probably use unique on. So essentially, if ever you got a field that is never allowed to have more than one value to ever exist in it, outside of the primary key, you can always create a unique index It'll only ever allow the value to exist once. It'll actually give you an error if you try to put it in twice. And then you got non-unique indexes. Uh, those are for fields that are often used to uh, group individual entities. Uh, in other words, you're going to search for a zip or a postal code, product categories, um, theoretically phone numbers or cities, that kind of thing. Um, and the syntax is there at the bottom there, which is Pretty straightforward. So this is the two kinds right there. So you got create unique index, you give it a name, right? So you got create unique index. What's in uppercase is this SQL syntax keywords. Uh, the next thing is the name of the index on the name of the table and the field or fields that, it, that are being indexed. And if it's a non-unique, you just skip the word unique. So it's create index. You can have multiple fields um, on it by comma delimiting. So just keep that in mind because I don't want to forget to talk about 
what about that in case it doesn't come up in the slides. Um, there's a cleaner version of that creating index. All right, so here's the double index one. I couldn't remember if it was in the slides. Um, so you create an index. And they decided to call it double index as the example because we're indexing two columns. And we're going to index the table called person and age and city are the two columns we're going to index. So it will help if you do a query like select star from person where age is 55 and city is equal to Seattle. However, it will not help if you don't have the age in it. Because the indexes, when the query optimizer, you type in your query, you hit run. The query optimizer reads the query. It goes, okay, here's what we're searching on. Do we have any indexes that match this? Do we have, well, we got, we're searching for these two fields. Oh, we got an index that's got both fantastic. We're going to use that. It will speed up our search. However, if it doesn't find an index that meets the criteria, in this case, we didn't create one just for city, it's going to say, hey, there's nothing where the, it's only city being searched. I don't have an index, so I don't know how to deal with this. Table scan. Top to bottom. So this is saying that so this is basically basically here to demonstrate that the query optimizer is not able to use half of an index. If that makes sense. Because the way the data is stored in the index is it's binary and it stores the values for 55 and for Seattle, and basically the combination of all of those values are stored in the index. So when you search for that combination of values, it'll find the closest match and use that. But if your index doesn't have all the pieces or it's missing pieces or it's got too many pieces, then the optimizer doesn't know what to do with it. So it chooses to just table scan. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a few gotchas with indexes, which is not on the slides. Indexes are cool, they speed things up. And for those of you that are experiencing some slight lag in your queries for lab nine, feel free to create some indexes on the foreign keys because MySQL doesn't index foreign keys by default. Um, this is where you find out who's got good laptops and who's got crappy laptops. Um, either laptops with really slow RAM or really slow hard drives or you know, too busy having steam and all kinds of other stuff running in the background. Feel free to create indexes on your foreign keys. You'll probably see a performance lift for your queries for lab nine. So indexes do have a few issues, one of which I just highlighted here, where if you don't have an index that matches, it's not going to get picked up. So then everybody turns around and says, why not create an index on everything? We'll create an index on column A, on column B, on column C, on column D. Then we'll create a combination of A and B, C and D, blah, 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 blah. Cool. However, every single time you add a row to the database or update the row to the database, it needs to update the pertinent indexes. Great. Let's say we got 10 indexes. We're going to insert one row into the database. Write operation number one, row is being written. Start listing off the index. Oh, index one. Okay, where does it need to go in index one? Find the position, good. Write index one, index two, index three, index four. So you could suddenly have an insert that might run in a thousandth of a second, take one to two seconds. And then you got a thousand hits a minute. Your server's just going, please stop. It's overwhelmed. It's you're going to wear out the disks. Um, back in the day, we'd wear out the bearings in our hard drives. Now we wear out our our memory chips. It's not great. <laughs> so we don't tend to want to do that too much. Um, two, they take up space. I've seen cases where the index has actually took up more room than the table itself. So let's just say each row in the table occupies. 500 bytes. And then each index, is, each index might occupy 25 bytes. We've got 10 indexes. Suddenly your indexes are taking up more room than the actual row of data. So that, yes. 
I'll be heading there in a moment. Then the last gotcha is if you have too many indexes, the query optimizer does not know which index to grab sometimes. Like in this example here, we have an index for age and city. So what would happen is if we had an index on age, an index on city, and an index on age and city, the query optimizer will look for the most performant index and use that one. And depending on the situation, it might pick the wrong index. Now, good database engines like Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, DB2 allows you to tell it which index to use as part of the query. Sometimes, you know, you'll realize that it's not so great. You can't do that with MySQL. I'm pretty sure you can't do it with Postgres either. Um, just you can't do index hinting with those. So their optimizers will try to make a best guess. It's not very smart. It just looks at the stats of the indexes and goes, that's the one I'm going to use. And or you might decide to use two separate indexes. So it might use the index for age and the index for city, then collate the results from that instead of using the combo one. So then it's scanning two sets of indexes, twice as much IO to do the same goal. Which the goal is, is we try to have as few indexes as possible that does the job, which is not going to answer his question. How do you choose the right fields for an index? You choose columns that are off frequently searched. Foreign keys. Those are the two big ones. So by freak or you'd also sometimes want to go with the combination of columns that is frequently searched. Combo indexes aren't as useful as individual indexes because most times you're searching only against one thing. Um, so fields that are commonly searched on, if you're dealing with a customer relation management system, probably phone number, email, a person's name. Names are iffy to search on under the best of circumstances anyways. How many different spellings of Elaine have you seen in your lives? I've seen eight. In my last 12 years here. Um, only three of them look normal. So that's when parents try to get creative to their kids' names because they want their kids to be unique and their names will never show up on a mug <laughs> because the spelling's weird. He's laughing. My daughter complains at me because she can never find her name on anything and her name's not even that weird. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so that's what you do is you look at which fields are going to be searched on the most. And sometimes... After it gets used a lot, you'll notice that some queries start slowing down. So then you'll want to investigate the pattern of usage, see which ones are affecting the searches the most, and maybe index that combination of fields that are often used. So it's a combination of preemptive indexing and then performance observations. Different database engines give you different tools to identify what's running. Um, if ever you get the pleasure to work with AWS, like Amazon Web Services with their database services, uh, they have this amazing tool uh, called Performance Insights. And it shows you which queries are the most expensive. And you can actually then open them up and actually see what queries are being run to see which ones are costing the most in resources and performance. So then you can tweak those. Um, like at work, we had one query that ran fine for years and suddenly, it went from taking, you know, one or two seconds to run to, you know, a minute or two. And we're like, what the heck's wrong with this? I went, I looked at it, I added one index and we were running under half a second. Just because I realized, hey, we never indexed that one field that, you know, years later we realized we needed that index there. So hopefully that answered your question, if he's even paying attention. <laughs> Just, you know you pick what people are going to search on and then you analyze later and you index that too. That's essentially it. Okay. Transactions. Okay. So transactions is an interesting topic. I'm actually going to be pulling up slides from my other course too, towards the end of this, because this doesn't have all the pieces I like to demonstrate to you guys about how it actually works. Um, so you guys are actually going to get a more rounded discussion about indexes than the other groups are. All right. <clears throat> a transaction is a unit of work that changes the state of the database. 
essentially, if you issue a single insert statement, that is a transaction. You do a single update, that is a transaction. You do a delete from and you forget the where clause, that is still a single transaction. However, normally when we refer to transactions in the database world, we're not talking about one-off commands. We're talking about groups of commands that need to work together. So it's usually a sequential group of statements that need to be done as a single unit of work that are either gonna be committed or rolled back. So committed means it gets written to the disk, rolled back means pretend it never happened. And when all the changes are committed to are executed successfully, then you can commit it. If anything fails, we roll it back. Uh, usually it only affects insert, update, and delete. Um, so MySQL transactions and explicitly whenever they see a commit or a rollback. Um, a transaction will end implicitly if they issue a DDL command. So for example, you do insert, insert, update, insert, update, delete, and then you alter table. Even if you had started a transaction, it will automatically commit at that point because you're changing the structure of the database and a transaction cannot survive the changing of the structure of the database. It is something like a checkpoint. There's actually checkpoints involved inside of MySQL. Um, so when we talk about transactions, we refer to an acronym called ACID. ACID's been around forever. Um, it was literally coined in the 70s, even though, you know, that phrase has been around since before the 70s. Um, it's, there's four words. There's one called atomic. This refers to the fact that every statement within the group is required to be performed successfully. This means that if I issue a begin transaction statement, everything that follows until it either sees commit or rollback is considered a single unit of work. So in the real world, um, I often like using getting out of bed as the example for a transaction. Okay, you're laying in bed, you're covered, alarm goes off. To be able to be, consider the transaction successful, you're gonna be standing on your feet. Every single step from this standing must execute successfully to be considered a successful transaction. Otherwise, it fails. Regardless of how it fails, why it failed, whatever, essentially from this to this, and every step in between is considered a single unit of work. Most of us don't think about how many steps are involved in getting our butts out of bed in the morning. Uh, there's a fair amount. There's consistent. Consistent or consistency uh, refers to the fact that the database must be consistent before the transaction starts and then consistent when the transaction ends. The best example for this one that I have is transferring money in a bank account. So we have account A and account B. Account A has $1,000. Account B has $0. We decide we want to transfer $100 from A to B. Everybody thinks that's easy. Take 100 from A, put it in B. No. And depending on what bank you're dealing with, the order of operations is slightly different, but they all do essentially the same thing. They begin a transaction. And they're saying there's a transaction block. We're going to put in $100 in B. Step one plus 100. So at this point in time, this has, still has $1,000, but now this one has $100. That's half the job. Then they will subtract $100. And at that point, we will have $900 here, $100 here, and then it'll commit it to their systems. What consistent means, it means that before we start, this is stable. Once it ends, 
this is stable, and it should reflect what we just asked to have happened. If some unknown reason we do plus 100 and then server decides to blow up at that microsecond that this is happening, we suddenly have an extra hundred dollars in our possession. Therefore, that is not a valid transaction. The database is now inconsistent because somehow we invented a hundred dollars. There's no such thing as take a hundred and put it here. It's always add a hundred, then take a hundred off, or take a hundred off, then add a hundred. Um, some other systems will actually have like a third table where it takes the hundred from here, puts it in the third table, and then takes it from the third table, puts it in the second table, and then it just makes sure everything works right. Almost like you know, what they call um, double entry ledger accounting. That's essentially what they're doing. So this is what consistency means. Isolation. While one transaction is playing with the data, nobody should be able to see it happening. It should be invisible. And I'll actually be doing demonstrations of this. Uh, it'll make so much more sense to actually do it for you in front of you guys. So essentially what it means is that when one transaction is running and another transaction is running, they do not see each other's stuff that they're doing until everything's been committed and it's consistent. And it's going to head into something called durable, which is the next letter. Whatever's happening does not exist. It's happening somewhere else. And then the last one is durability. Durability means when the changes get written to the disk, they're immutable. In other words, once it's committed and written to the disk, it is there. Yeah, there could be another transaction that comes a second later and then takes money out again. Like whatever happens to my bank account on the first of the month, it's like negative, 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 right? We all know that feeling. And but it'll happen not at the exact same time, but each of those transactions are actually happening in isolation from each other. And then they're applied as a group at the end. Which is why sometimes, have you ever had the experience where you know there's money in your account and you look at your balance and then you try to use your card and it says, no, you, there's no money there? It's because there's probably a transaction happening that's tied up your money and they're using that third table to say that there's money in front and it's just saying no until it's done playing with your cash. Uh, nowadays, it's actually quite rare for that to happen because the banks have gotten so much faster. I mean, heck, man, I can tap my phone and the money disappears out of my account. That's pretty darn quick compared to back in the day. I remember, you know, doing the good old debit when we used to swipe the card before we had chips and tap. And literally, sometimes you could count almost a minute from the time you swiped to when it was done because it would take so long. And everybody was amazed that it only took a minute. So, yeah. So durability means once it's done, it gets written to the disk. End of story. It means that once it's done, it's permanent. All right. So in MySQL, there's a command called start transaction. Um, there's also one called begin. There's and begin work. The most common one used is begin because begin is everywhere. Uh, start transaction is a bit of an odd one, but it's like MySQL specific. But it's begin. Commit is used everywhere. On the other hand, commit means everything worked. We're committing to the results of what we just tried to do. It will take it. It will write it out to the disk. End of story. At that the moment, commit is executed and the next checkpoint fires off which I'll be explaining what checkpoints are in a moment. It's on the disk, never to be lost again. Rollback means as you were doing your transaction and doing stuff, you suddenly an error came back from the database server and you're like, well, that didn't go the way it was supposed to. We can issue a rollback and it will just undo everything that just happened up to the start of the begin. So this is the closest to undo you will get in a database server. It doesn't mean undo actually exists, but you can begin and then do a rollback. Um, I've actually seen students when they're doing assignment two, just put a begin at the beginning, run the entirety of assignment two, and then at the end, just do a rollback as they're testing their scripts so they don't do whatever. It works. So there's also something called set auto commit, which can enable or disable um, 
auto commit mode. So by default, MySQL runs in what's called auto commit. So you issue insert into table A, and you hit run, it fires it, tries to run it, and commits it. If you turn off auto commit, it will keep every single of those insert statements running as if it's a single transaction until you issue a commit command to yourself. Oracle, for example, by default runs in that mode. It has auto commit turned off. You actually have to force the commit with Oracle, unless you flip it. Um, so there's a few settings here to show you how to change the auto commit. Um, save points. And a save point, and some of them call it checkpoint, they have they use slightly different words, different engines, allows you to actually put a marker in the middle of a transaction saying, okay, step one, step two, step three, step four, save point. Step five, step six, oh, step six failed, roll back to the save point. We can try five and six again, because maybe the data was in flux, so we're gonna try it a second time without aborting the entire transaction. And we can choose to just go to the save point, commit that change, because maybe whatever's happening after that is not as mission critical. You know, like maybe something can be picked up along the way later. So in here, we could put in a checkpoint after the plus 100, the save point. And if this one didn't work, we could suddenly go back and roll back and try it again. Um, You could create multiple save points. If you got a really complex transaction, I've never seen one that needs more than one save point, but you can have multiple save points and you can choose to roll back to which one you want. You can go just save point one, save point two. If you just do a roll back without a save point, it'll come to the most recent one. Um, you know, it's like when you're playing video games and you hit that wonderful auto save just before you ran out of ammo the same thing. You, you just keep rolling back to that point in time. And you can choose to roll back to a specific save point. You can release a save point. Um, so you did save point one, a couple more things. Save point two, you can choose to release save point one because we reached save point two. We don't need to worry about save point one anymore. There's just different things you can do. Um, there's not much to be said about that. And the syntax literally is as follows save point give it a name roll back to name release save point name um, i've used this functionality maybe once in the last 10 years because it was just so happened to be that all the transactions i worked with either had to completely work or not work at all there was no ah eh, you know if it kind of worked good enough kind of situation we just didn't have that yep that's your choice I mean, if you were working with a web app or a Java app, each command you issue is treated as separate connection anyways. So this is more when you're working interactively. So if you're going to be doing something that's potentially dangerous, yes, turn off auto commit. But if you're just, you know, doing some select and you're adding one value to a table, it depends on what you need to do at that moment. Okay, so now I'm going to pull up the slides from the other one, then I'll do the demo. Uh, where is it? Okay, I'm gonna go right from here. Okay, so this is showing the lifetime of different transactions. And we have five transactions and I'm actually, as I go through the rest of the slides in this, uh, you'll see what each of these things mean. But essentially we're gonna be playing with five transactions. So this is specifically when we're talking about system recovery. So transactions are running and something terrible happens which is the whole point of the transaction, right? Is if something terrible happens, we don't lose whatever's happening in the transaction. So any transaction that was running at the time of failure needs to be undone and restarted. 
uh, anything that was committed needs to be redone. So when we look at the, this slide, type one does not need to be redone. Type two and four will need to be redone. Three and five are gonna be undone. Now the checkpoint means is when the data is taken from memory and written physically to the disk. System failure, I can give you three guesses what that means. The server is no longer having a nice day and neither are you. That's what system failure means. Okay, so when we talk about transactions and they're as they're running, there's a something called a transaction log. And in the transaction log, there's two sections. There's something called undo and a section called redo. And by the way, you can't go look at this file. It's in binary, you know, there's just no way for you to actually understand what's in there. So for every entry in the log, starting from the last checkpoint, it will start putting things in. So currently, this is right where we started. And transaction one started and completed before the checkpoint. It's been written to the disk. It's not going to be in either the undo or the redo log. Transaction two and three are started. Checkpoint fires off. That means that the, the database server is still working on it, even though the data just got written to the disk. So we just wrote something to the disk, but two and three aren't complete. So that is not going to be written to the disk. It's just sitting there in memory. So they're put into what's called the undo. Because at this point in time, we don't know whether or not they're going to complete. Therefore, if they can't complete successfully, they should never have happened in the first place. So we want them to go away, thus they're an undo. So now we start transaction number four. You'll see this green line is slowly moving across the slide. Transaction four starts, transaction four gets added also to the undo pile. Great, we've got three things in undo. And transaction five starts, transaction five is also existing in undo because nothing's been com completed yet. Fantastic. Transaction two just received its commit command. It is moved from the undo into redo. So what's happening is the actual literal commands, insert, update, delete, whatever, plus whatever records are being affected will be put in to the redo. So it knows what needs to be redone in order also of which rather one, whichever one finishes first, because they have to be redone in the same order as they completed. Now, transaction four completes, commit is received. Transaction four moves to the redo. So now we have transaction three and five sitting in undo, two and four sitting in redo. And of course, I don't have the last slide. So it gets, the green line picture it moves over to that last line where the server shits the bed. It's a, now in a state of failure. When the server restarts, it will look at the undo log and the redo log. It'll do a forward recovery and a backwards recovery at the same time. So it will redo in order which one's finished first. And then it'll also undo in reverse order whatever failed last. And you'll reach a point of equilibrium in the middle where all the transactions that could be completed did complete, and all the ones that couldn't complete have been undone. And therefore, things are now durable. So that's what I wanted to talk about was the lifetime of the transaction as things are happening to the server. Now, I'm going to demonstrate the transactions. Okay, so MySQL Workbench, yay. And I'm going to connect once and twice. And by the way, I'm actually showing you guys how to do the lab that has to do with transactions. Yeah. I'm practically showing you guys how to do lab 10, FYI, if you haven't done it yet. All right, so I'm gonna use this example database here. Uh, sample, not example. Okay. So you can see here, I've got a bunch of names and I'm gonna connect example in my second connection. You'll notice that I'm using two separate tabs, not 
Two separate tabs here. These are separate connections. So when the lab tells you to la launch two connections, that's what it means. Like you literally click on your on your launch on your home screen, whatever you call this. You do it twice, and it'll give you two connections. And in here, we will show you again. Select star from uh, sample. Okay, so you can see that I'm not lying. It's the same data for both. Fantastic. Now, if I were to go do delete from sample where ID is equal to eight, no transaction. I hit go, and I can come up to this one, do it again, and we can see Frank's gone, right? That's what you would expect. Now I'm going to go delete from, I'm going to actually begin a transaction. And with this lab, you actually have to run it all in one go. So you can't just type in begin, hit run, type in the next command, hit run. You've got to literally do it all in one block. Um, with the older versions of MySQL, that used to work. Um, Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be extra. Okay, and I'm going to run this whole block like this. Boom. Empty, right? Because I just deleted. I'm going to go to my second connection. It's still there. Remember when I was talking about isolation? So because I started a begin command here, but I never committed. It's still in flux. In other words, the transaction is ongoing. It's still waiting for me to tell it, yes, I'm happy with these changes. No, I am not happy with these changes. So I could issue the rollback command and run these two. So I'm going to run this block right here. And now my data is back because I rolled it back because I said, hey, it didn't work. Now let's turn this around and go, let's commit. Yes, some people have commitment issues. But sometimes when you're doing the work, you just got to commit to it, right? So I'm going to hit go. And you will see data is gone. Now I go to my other tab. Data is gone. Because I committed. It's durable. Every other connection can see it. So if you've got a thousand people looking at the database, the moment that commit hits, everybody can see your changes. And that was good because now I got to actually repopulate my database. So I'm going to go here and go insert into sample. I'm going to insert the name, values. Bob's coming back for a visit. And if I run this whole thing, you will see uh, no, over here, Bob's back. Now, you will notice that the ID didn't go back to one because I didn't truncate the table. I just deleted the contents of the table. And I can turn around and keep inserting, you know, Bill and Vein, like that. I'm not going to issue the commit. I'm going to hit run. Those are there. I hit run. Still not there until I hit the commit. And now Bill and Jane showed up to the party. So for something that looks that simple in practice, there's an awful lot of magic happening behind the scenes. Like I said, you literally you could go to uh, university and actually take a course dedicated on how transaction works on the inside. Um, there's conflict resolution. There's all kinds of things you can do to issue saying, hey, if there's two transactions happening at the same time, they're trying to edit the same data. Often what happens is whichever one finishes first wins. 
which I had a student like with my other course asked me, you know what happens? You got your actions altering the same record. Whichever one finishes first wins. The problem is whoever finishes last is going to be end, end up being the winner. Because 1,000 minus 100, this one tries to do a minus 100. This one finishes at minus 100. Then this one does minus 100, right? So it's all a matter of time. And computers run so fast that most of the time it's pretty transparent. Yes. It's just something you got to watch for. Uh, realistically, the odds in a high volume environment that two people are modifying the exact same piece of data at the same time, pretty small. Unless they're doing like a massive delete or a massive update. Then you got the case of, oh, we started this big massive update over here. We includes a where clause, and then we fire off a shorter one here, and this one finishes first. But this one had started first. Then they have what's called conflict resolution. And it'll actually try to figure out what it should do. And it may decide, hey, I can't do that. It's wrong. And the whole thing just blows up. Um, but realistically, that's you know, what you guys need to know about transactions is you should begin. You do your stuff. You either should commit, commit or roll back and life is good. Um, another special little note about MySQL. Um, there's only one table type in MySQL that supports transactions. Uh, for those of you that might remember during lab one, where I made you guys double check that a certain setting was set to NODB. I think way, way back to the start of the term when you install MySQL. And I said, you know, there's this one spot, make sure it's called NODB. In MySQL, if your table is not NODB, it doesn't support transactions. And it is now the default table type, but used to not be the default table. You actually have to actively choose to be able to support transactions in your database by making sure your tables are NODB. Uh, otherwise, there are my ISOM tables, which is the next default. And what would happen is you'd issue the begin command. My would go, bro, I got gotcha. you. Do your commands, blah, 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 blah. Issue commit. Guess what? The entire time it was committing. Because it ignored begin, commit, or roll back. There's no such thing with my ISOM tables in MySQL. Every other database server that I know of, that's that they all support transaction and you don't need something special to tell it to do it. You actually have to go out of your way to turn it off. Okay. That was the last of the topics for the term. Yay. So, like I said, uh, next week I will be doing the review. So you guys are aware. Um, all the sections are writing together. As far as I know, we're all in the gym. Um, at the same time, fun times in the gym. Do you know where the gym is? Not the gym and not the fancy gym. The shitty gym where they play basketball and volleyball by the Tim Hortons. I just got to give that stupid landmark. It's like, I don't know what gym you're talking about. Next to Tim Hortons. Down the hall from the hairdresser. For those of you that have actually gone, you can get your hair done here at the school for cheap. The hairdressing students or the massage students will also give you a massage for cheap. You're there for like two hours, though. But, you know, cheap massage, cheap hair. What is that? I think it's like five bucks for a haircut. I think it's like five or six bucks for a haircut. Last 15 now? It used to be like five bucks. But even 15 is still cheaper than going to first choice. <laughs> And they're probably going to do a better job because the instructors are watching them. Um, so that's where we're going to be is in the gym. A120, if I remember right. Let me double check that to make sure I'm not lying. And I'm even willing to record this so to make sure I'm not lying. This is so much faster at the school than it is when I'm getting at it from home. Yes. Congratulations, Saturday. April 15th at 9 a.m. For those of you busting in from Orleans, I feel bad for you. Because you're going to be getting on the bus at 6. <laughs> and maybe you'll get here in time. Okay? And uh, I'll be giving you guys this warning also next week, but I like to give it twice. The rule, if you were late for the exam, 
You will be allowed to sit down and write if nobody else has left the room. The moment the first student finishes, you're SOL. If you don't know what SOL means, it's something out of luck. That's just there's somebody under 18 in the room, so I can't use that particular phrase. So you are SOL. If I've had a case where literally somebody was walking out the door, somebody else walked in, and it's like, whoo. Like I looked at them and I just waited for them. I'm going another 30 seconds. We probably would let them write in 30 seconds, but you know, anything more in 30, 40 seconds, you have the time to go out and actually say, you know, questions one to five, A, C, D, E, F. It doesn't take long to transmit 45, 50 questions. Yeah. Yes. I will be there. The other two lecture profs are going to be there. Most of the lab profs are going to be there to invigilate. Normally, there's about five or six profs in that room. All right.